Thank you, thank you very much, Bangi. And uh, yes, it's really a pleasure for me. And actually, I mean, as she said, we have been, I had the privilege actually to work with Shubangi years back. And I think, uh, and the privilege to be in India, I would say. So it's uh, like a little bit coming back home, no? So thank you, Shubangi, for this opportunity. And, uh, and as she said, please feel free to interrupt me also, you know, if uh, sometimes my, my English is not too clear or if I'm going too fast. Um, as uh, Shubangi mentioned, I'm Italian uh, and I'm very talkative. So I have actually a lot of things I would like to share with you. Um, I've been uh, many years in UNESCO in the system and I work in a number of regions. Uh, I've been uh, in, uh, moved to our headquarters in Paris um, just at the end of last year. And my function is actually to be in charge of the section that works on global citizenship and peace education that for us is, uh, you know, really at the heart of the mandate of, uh, of the organization. So what... Uh, um, Shubangi asked me actually to, to talk about today is how we can see uh, the, the role actually of education when it comes to the promotion of global citizenship and, uh, and, and peace and to look uh, you know, a little bit at what is happening also in this discourse around the world. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, the way what I prepare, actually, um, I had prepared some nice videos and uh, but I was not because of the time I was not ready i can share it actually with with the colleagues so in case you can have it later on i would like to take you know to really take the perspective of uh, rethink uh, how we can actually rethink the world we want through education and particularly through global citizenship and uh, since i know that uh, you i've seen actually uh, the, the work that you are doing uh, in uh, in uh, so big part actually of india and i've seen also in your publication that you you talk a lot about transformation which is really actually the heart of this uh, agenda, global agenda for sustainable development. So I'm going to focus a little bit uh, in putting into context global citizenship into the broader 2030 development agenda. Uh, we will look at it a little bit. Hello. 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 Well, and then we can conclude, uh, um, you know, just with some consideration, um, looking at also the current crisis that we are going to live through. I'm not going to focus uh, from the beginning on this uh, big uh, pandemic that is really devastating, I would say, big part of the world. But of course, this has an impact in, in, in the future that we want to build, right? So we'll, we'll close with that. So just to start, I think... Uh, Probably many of you have heard about the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, this has really become our global framework for development. Um, and these goals actually have been uh, designed and agreed in a context that is quite particular. In, in the past year, in the past, uh, I would say, um, 20 years uh, of uh, um, global commitments to global goals. Um, we are now actually in a new um, historical juncture, uh, if we want, which is ca characterized by um, increasing level of complexity, of uh, uncertainty and of contradiction. And we see, I think we live it every day. So we, we you know, in these um, years, I think we have been seeing different three main tensions if we want. Greater wealth in the country, big wealth, I think the world has never been so rich, but at the same time, we have witnessed a growing vulnerability and inequality in every country. Um, we, um, we live under a very strong ecological stress and unsustainable patterns of consumption and of production, and this is also given to the big number of population that has tripled between just the 1950 and 
2000. Uh, consumption of food and water has really doubled in the last 50, 60 years. So the demand, so the, the, the expansion of the lifestyles of many middle classes in many countries has increased. And, and so it has the depletion of natural resources. And I think, uh, again, with this crisis, we are also, you know, looking at that. This has been even amplified. And then what we can see, is that there is, uh, we, we live an increase interconnection and interdependence among ourselves, among our countries. However, we can see an increasing level of intolerance and an expansion of conflict. I think uh, you may agree that we have never seen uh, a generation that have been so um, rich with information, with knowledge, which is widely available. Uh, but at the same time, uh, despite you know being more educated, more informed, more aware, particularly the youth, um, we witness really this increased level of violence and intolerance and conflict. And again, the current crisis, I think it has really amplified that. And, and what is important, and that's where then global citizenship will come in, the challenges that we live today really go beyond the national borders um, and, and are impacting everyone when it comes to address conflict or violent extremism or intolerance, discrimination, um, when it comes to address climate change. So these challenges, as we said, point to interdependence, uh, which is increased interconnectedness and uh, concrete challenges, global challenges that have a really far reaching impact. And therefore, if we want to have solution, we want to find solution for that, to understand how our local action influences well global trends and how actually we can learn from our experiences to address together global challenges. So this was the context that when uh, uh, you know the, the global development agenda, the agenda 2030 was actually uh, discussed and, uh, and designed with the central concern for what is sustainable development, right? Um, a, a context in which the, our economic growth is actually um, guided by also environmental management and also concern for social justice. Um, so, and uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this rethinking actually of our world, uh, on how we can transform our world, uh, we also need to recognize, and we have recognized with this agenda, the diversity of cosmovision, of worldviews, of, conce of, con of concept of human well-being. And at the same time, what we have reaffirmed is a set of common core of universal values. And that's why the education, that the aim of education for um, this uh, century must really be to maintain and improve the dignity, the well-being of the human person in relation to the others and also in relation with, the, with nature. And this is what we can really describe as what we call humanism in, uh, in, in education. So this agenda is actually an agenda that is, a, is an action plan. We can call it an action plan uh, for the people, for the planet and for our prosperity. Now just to conclude on, on, the, on this part, this is an agenda that consists of 17 sustainable development goals uh, that was adopted by the world leaders in 2015. So, and, and what is interesting with this agenda is that it's an agenda that, that speaks to every type of country, north, south, west, east, um, because we also, there, there is an understanding that uh, um, we all have challenges, um, and I think we all have still a long way to go to really achieve uh, you know, prosperity and peace for all our people. So these are a set of goals that are universally applied, um, and they are absolutely highly integrated uh, with a very specific objective, which I think it's important for us to keep in sight, in focus, especially for us working in, in education, which is ensuring that no one is left behind. And I think this applies actually very much to the work that uh, your organization, uh, I can see, it is doing. And, uh, um, and what is interesting, actually, these are goals that are integrated, but it has, uh, uh, these are 17 goals. One of it is dedicated to uh, education. Now, what is clear is that 
um, the, this uh, um, indivisibility of this goal means actually that it's very difficult to achieve uh, well-being for everyone without achieving all of them. Uh, education cannot uh, be, um, our targets on education cannot be achieved without, for example, social protection or without looking at the protection of the environment or without working and increasing uh, decent work, for example. So, um, what um, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important what I was saying is um, that th this agenda places education as a central element in advancing the three dimension of, of programs. So the environmental one, the social one, and the economic uh, one. Um, now, what does it mean to put this uh, goal on education um, at the center of, uh, of all these uh, uh, big effort? Now, this agenda gives us also responsibility, which is that education really needs to be prof profoundly transformed in order to, um, to unleash its potential and respond to the challenges that we see humanity and the planet are uh, facing, which means actually that we really need to rethink our system. And, uh, uh, and reaffirming this focus on education and development, this humanistic focus, right? And, uh, and, uh, and working for us on this concept of global citizenship, of um, global citizen education, what does it really mean? Now, if we look at content and methods, uh, rethinking education really means reaffirming core ethical values, which are equal rights and social justice, which are cultural and social diversity, um, a sense of shared responsibility and commitment to international uh, solidarity for our com common future. This is really at the heart of global citizenship education. It means uh, an integrated approach to learning, uh, which really goes beyond uh, a utilitarian approach to education and uh, what we can say, uh, um, a more narrow political approach to employability. These are very important and we know. Um, but uh, I think we, 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 we really need to give equal importance to the social, the cultural, the civic dimension of uh, uh, the education. Um, I think we, UNESCO has um, one of his, um, I would say, key um, um, think pieces and document that has really somehow um, uh, been the basis of a lot of our uh, discourse in education in the past, I would say, uh, 40, 50 years, uh, is a document that was produced in the 90s by the Delors Commission that has, uh, this, that, that has uh, um, promoted four pillars of, the so-called four pillars of learning, learning to know, learning to do, learning to be and to live together. Uh, and this is also the time to rethink that because some of these four pillars of learning, particularly the one on learning to live together, has not been so much developed uh, and advanced, I would say, in the last few decades compared to um, uh, the other one. Now, um, learning to be and learning to live together, these are key. They, these really reflect the socialization function that education um, has and I would say going back to the current context of increased violence and conflict these are actually increasingly threatened right and need to be protected so um, we need to strengthen these ethical principles and values in the in the learning process which is really essential to protect this vision of of education and again I can see in the work that you are doing in uh, uh, in your institution uh, I think this is a principle that you really have at the center um, learning to know and learning to do this should also be recontextualized you know uh, let's look at the volume of information now that is available for example in the digital world it's really amazing right um, however we face a number of challenges how to identify credible sources how to make sense of this big amount of information how we can really question sometimes the accuracy of the information knowing that is valid and is reliable um, so this is just to say that uh, this, uh, um, uh, there has been a, a big thinking in general on uh, uh, developing skills and competences 
that really face this challenge in a way that really lead us to have a transformation in our system. Um, so when we talk about an integrated approach to the development of skills and competencies that we say are critical in our uh, reality, this should really be guided by um, a solid ethical foundation that is really important and essential for education to be really transformative. Now, when we come to the policy, um, the type of policy that we need, uh, you know, when uh, we want to um, have, when we, when we have this humanistic approach to education, certainly it means a central concern for equity, so for an education that does not marginalize nor exclude, and I think, again, you, you know, Brian, what we talk about, for an inclusive policy development, um, um, we, it, it means a recognition on the, of the need for a more open and flexible uh, lifelong system, a life-wide system, where learning actually cuts across all ages uh, in the life, the life cycle, but also it is given in every type of context, life-wide. Education is not just what happens in the former school, right? Uh, but you have a lot of centers, a lot of environment uh, uh, in, in our life where we actually also learn and, and where we interact um, uh, in, in, in very in less formal learning spaces. Um, it means reaffirming the fundamental role of teachers and, and of other educators. Uh, and I think now teachers, and we'll see also the importance of this for global citizenship, teachers are considered as guide. So there is a change in role of teachers uh, to really be uh, learning uh, facilitators. And I'm sure you would have a lot of practices to share on that. Um, and uh, um, there is the need to reverse the deprofessionalization of teachers. Uh, although, you know, we, we know and we hear that the discourse on the importance of teachers is, is very common. And I think now with this big crisis, it has been very clear, uh, you know, teachers are really um, it, it was clear in the eyes of the world of the essential role that the educators uh, play. But we know also that there is really a process that has been going on for a long time of the professionalization. But in, in all countries, both in the global north and in the south, uh, the unqualified teachers entering in the, in the system, the, the erosion of the quality of the teaching profession, um, the difference in remuneration, for example, right, of teachers and professionals in other sectors in many countries. And then, of course, the importance of school uh, leadership. So these are all reflections that for us have been very important when it comes to rethinking uh, education. And, uh, and, uh, and, and all these reflection has really underpinned the design of this key goal of education in the global agenda. And in particular, um, this uh, goal focuses on education that has 10 targets that we have to achieve the country committed to achieve as one in particular that is really at the heart, I would say, of this agenda, and that's where global citizenship education is actually rooted in, which is a target uh, 4.7 that deals with uh, skills and competencies that are needed to have a more just and peace and sustainable uh, world. So, um, what is it, our vision when it comes uh, to global citizenship um, education? As I said, global citizenship education is part of this global agenda, is part of this uh, specific target, and uh, um, is really based on the belief that is our constitution, by the way, is enshrined in our constitution of UNESCO, that peace is built in the minds of men and women. And peace is not just the absence of war, we know that. Um, we consider global citizenship education a defining element of quality education. Why? Because it aims to ensure the relevance of education to all learners. We know that when it comes to the de definition of the key dimension of an education of quality, the relevance is a key one. If an education is not relevant to the learner, 
we cannot really consider an education of quality. If it doesn't speak to the reality of the learning, if it doesn't meet certain needs of the learners, we cannot talk about an education of quality. So global citizenship education aims to provide uh, competencies and, uh, and values, ethical values that empower really learners to become active to become um, agent that can transform, that can build a common humanity. And, uh, and um, why it is important um, in, um, in, in why this type of education, global citizenship is of relevant in the current uh, reality <clears throat> of globalization that we live is that it expresses a sense of belonging to a broader community, belonging to a common and to a global uh, humanity. Um, it involves uh, um, the understanding, the education, the training for a political, for a social, for a cultural interdependence and interconnect interconnectedness between uh, people. And doing this actually requires the articulation of the local, the national and the global level for um, we say for the construction of a common knowledge and common meanings that, um, that allow us to live together uh, in peace and with social justice. Um, when we talk about global citizenship education, and this is more um, seen uh, and more evident when it comes to our uh, programs work, let's say, it involves uh, a number of uh, uh, of, top, uh, of 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 disciplines. Actually, we, we talk about human rights education, education for peace. We talk about education for sustainable development, education for international uh, understanding. And what is clear is really that its implementation is throughout life, informal, non-formal, and informal uh, system, and it can incorporate programmatic intervention, extra programmatic intervention. Um, traditional and less traditional participation um, mechanism. And what is uh, uh, interesting, and that really bring GCD, Global Citizens Education, beyond just the content per se, is that it, it wants to be a sort of a holistic approach to education, system-wide, because it really makes us rethink the why, the what, the how and where we teach and, 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 and educate. Now, um, we, um, why it is important for us, you know, to work on this, uh, on this topic uh, um, in, in, this, in our current times. Um, you know, global citizenship and, peace, and global citizenship education has been uh, particularly launched um, globally during the, the time of the former Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, that really put it as one of the three key elements of his vision of, of education, actually, his program on, on education. Because, as we said, the challenges today go beyond national borders and have a global impact, so we need to find solution to that. And complex solution to complex challenges. And, um, and we need to be actually uh, relevant and respond to the aspiration of our new generation because young people, and you work with young people, and young women, young girls, want to contribute to society and they want to have a place in our society. Um, because young people are concerned about the future and they are also filled with hope and with a lot of expectations and uh, you know and global citizenship can really provide young people with the uh, tools to contribute to we hope, to build actually sustainable and peaceful uh, society so um we, to ensure that learners are actually uh, equipped to face these challenges, we need uh, systems that are grounded in local values, right, and committed to international solidarity. There has been a lot of, uh, um, uh, also, you know, a lot of discussion um, in, um, in, you know, in, in our gathered things when we, 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 we meet with the education community on global citizenship, also on the issue that sometimes this can be considered a sort of concept that can be alien to countries, uh, it, it comes more from the sort of Western world, that it can be considered a sort of luxury, but uh, what has been, um, um, what is it actually important to underline is also that uh, um, the links between the national and the traditional concept are really also at the heart of the ideas of GCD. Uh, we had actually um, some publication that were uh, done also looking at how 
countries have really national concept that convey a similar notion that those in global citizenship education. So this is not new. This is really something that is really found in the history, in the tradition of country uh, from France with this, uh, you know, um, motto of uh, the French Revolution to the concept of Ubuntu that I'm sure many of you are familiar with from uh, the, the Bantu languages in, in, in Southern Africa. No, Ubuntu is the essence of being a person. We are people because through other people, right? Um, there are other concepts in Africa, in, the, in, the, in Canada, for example, when they talk about the notion of multiculturalism, which is actually a national policy. Um, we have um, in the Andean, uh, countries in Latin America, they have a concept which is uh, um, what is called the well-being, is, is summa causae, is um, living well, right? So we can see that this is really actually a notion that is, is spread and somehow there are some key principles that uh, uh, are, are common, right, in, in this idea, which is respect for diversity, solidarity, and the shared sense of, uh, um, of humanity. Now, when it comes now to um, global citizenship education and how we can integrate that, how we work global citizenship in, in, uh, in, um, in the education system, we said this is a holistic approach uh, that uh, invites us to see the learning process from different dimensions at the different levels. Um, GCD uh, is based on three key domains of learning, which is the cognitive, um, the cognitive one, so understanding the world, um, acquiring analytical and critical th thinking skills. The second domain is the social emotional one, feeling of belonging to common humanity, the feeling of uh, solidarity, empathy, respecting the other. And finally, the behavioral domain of learning, behaving responsibly uh, to live together in a sustainable manner, uh, being engaged as a citizen's act. And these are, of course, interlinked and integrated into the learning, uh, into the learning uh, process. So global citizenship is considered to have this transformative potential. It has to be learned and centered, of course, uh, recognizing and valuing the knowledge and the real world experiences that the learners bring um, with them, including all the learners who may not have access to formal education because of various reasons. Um, global citizenship values the development of empathy, the appreciation of others, we say respect, solidarity, and is concerned with social justice and with human rights. And I think it's very important to highlight that. The outcome of teaching global citizenship education is really to get the students to critically think uh, about issues and act on issues of inequality that can be related to age, ethnicity, gender, uh, social class, or religion. And uh, it's also an important point, uh, which is the the, um, that a responsible global citizenship includes care for the environment and for its ecosystem. And it also enables learners to contribute positively to global questions and issues, right, they can have in their communities. So, at the local level, at the national, um, in the cities, in the, in the region, and those internationally. And, uh, um, and um, I think what is also central to this mandate of global citizenship is its potential uh, to, be, um, to be very instrumental in raising a critical global consciousness and to enable an inclusive participation of all learners from a diversity of backgrounds to really contribute towards shaping um, a more inclusive uh, society and just society. Um, one thing that uh, I think is, is important to mention is that there is also a growing evidence base supporting that the value that global citizenship has for uh, learners today is not only in terms of relevance, of course, but also in terms of uh, the related benefits in um, academic uh, uh, attainments. Um, now, when if we go to the world, if we look uh, around, there are a number of um, experiences, uh, successful experiences that country have when it comes to uh, the work done on uh, integrating uh, global citizenship um, education in uh, primary and sec at the secondary level, at the tertiary level as well. 
Um, and um, normally what UNESCO put forward, you know, when it comes to, um, to approaches of uh, global citizenship is really to, uh, to put in practice uh, what we call a whole school approach, uh, which really means looking at the vital dimension uh, of, uh, of the of, of the of, of the um, uh, the school system so uh, through cross curricular or integrated approaches that are certainly underpinned by teacher training um, and uh, by the relation and the work also done with the school community if we talk about school or the learning community and of course, also looking at the governance system of the school. We, we have this whole school approach when it comes to, for example, the work on um, education for sustainable development and climate change that has been very successful. And the GCD somehow is based on the same principle. Just to give you some example, there is, um, uh, and I will send you all the link also to this because as I said, I think it's always nice to see images and to understand better what happened in the countries through looking actually at uh, what, what is there. Uh, what is, and transformational pedagogy. There is an interesting experience that is in non-formal education actually when uh, in Brazil and this is actually an experience that has won also a, a recent UNESCO uh, Japan Prize on sustainable development and is undertaken by a foundation that is called the Sustainable Amazon Foundation and uh, they have this initiative that is called relevant education for the sustainable development in remote Amazon community which is really uh, aimed at making the forest worth more in value standing right upright rather than cutting down the forest and uh, and it's really a very interesting um, learning experience of this whole community which is really focused on uh, grassroots empowerment and uh, this is um, an initiative that uh, mainly provides capacity development for more than 500 communities who really survive on income generated from the forest. So this is a case really of a community that re really lives out of its own environment. And, uh, and this is a number of activity offered, vocational training and um, activity focus on environmental education, on traditional knowledge, for example, and, and sustainable management of uh, natural resources. And it has already achieved more than 40,000 people. And again, the principle of linking, you see the local to the global, it's very much applied there because the impact of uh, what happened globally with the deforestation has really a strong effect on the life of the these people but at the same time what this uh, community is able to to do with this empowerment initiative is it also has an impact overall on, on the overall country when it comes to another dimension uh, that we said of GCD which is on teacher ex um, on, on teacher and teacher development I think in Asia, in Asia and the Pacific region, there has been uh, some interested uh, initiative of exchanges among teachers. And, uh, and perhaps this is also something that, for example, with your organization, you could uh, um, look at. Um, the, you know, the Asia Pacific is also a region where, uh, and I'm sure you leave that, is, is, is under a strong pressure of um, strengthening global competence the global competences of the new generation, also due to these changes of globalization and the transition to more multicultural society. But um, uh, so many countries uh, in the region have been seen to face the, the difficulty of having to, at the same time, accomplish improvement in the general teaching competence, right? When we say to assure education of quality and also the reinforcements of competences in, in global education. So what uh, um, Korea did, um, they, uh, the support actually of the Ministry of Education of Korea, they launched an initiative which is called Asia Pacific Teacher Exchange for Global Education that was already launched uh, about eight, nine years ago. And this is a, a this is uh, like a bilateral teacher exchange program, in this case between the Co Republic of Korea and they have a number of other partner countries, mainly I would say in, in Southeast Asia for the time being. And these are exchanges that are um, aimed to promote mutual understanding and exchange of teaching experiences. And, uh, and uh, normally when you have these exchanges, teachers 
are given the opportunity to teach at a whole school of the partner country for about three, four months. And, uh, and of course, this is a program that not only enhances the quality of teaching through, you know, the international cooperation, but it also promotes, you know, the value and the principle of global citizenship education. And then another experience, my third one, and I will say for the moment, the third out of four, uh, is, uh, is about Canada, for example. Canada has been really embedding global citizenship education in their education system. And, and again, the Canada built on strong foundation of numeracy and literacy, which of course this is, uh, let's say, basic. But uh, um, the, um, the Council of Ministers of Education of Canada has been working on a, 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 on a national effort to prepare students for, co for a complex and, uh, as we said, unpredictable future with a contest that is rapidly changing politically, technologically, ecologically, let's say economically. So, um, and, the, and there was this agreement reached by all the federal ministers to have an, an educational institutions that really need to provide uh, the younger generations with um, skills, with the knowledge, with the values, the attitudes that they need to become learners throughout life and to understand issues of global interdependence and to be active global citizenship. So they develop a framework, they call that global competencies actually, that they integrate in their K-12 formal education programs across the country and they focus on a set of skill, of skills which are in particular critical thinking and problem solving, innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship, um, learning to learn, um, uh, learning self-awareness and self-direction, um, collaboration, communication, and global citizenship and sustainability. Uh, so, of course, these are competencies that can be developed over time, and um, and they are aimed really to equip the learners to with the ability to meet the shifting demands of life, work, and learning, the ongoing and shifted demands of life, work, and learning, to be active and to be responsive in their community, to leverage new technology, there is a strong technological component of that, and to understand uh, different perspective, to act responsibly uh, to new issues of global significance, and to embrace, let's say, uh, new opportunities that do not yet exist. Um, so this is, it is an interesting and big effort, actually, of Canada in that regard. Um, my last, uh, actually, uh, experience to share that uh, I would like to share with the video with you, and this was one of the things I had planned this morning, is an initiative that, as UNESCO, actually we have developed in the past few years which is called education for justice and the rule of law and actually we we really consider that a very important component of uh, of educate of a transformative education uh, why because uh, um we have been uh, what we have been um, seeing is that in many societies children are unfortunately led to believe sometimes that the absence of the rule of law is not just common but is acceptable uh, even in countries where one can say rule of law is is well established but you know we always face um, corruption scandal uh, social inequalities um, and and uh, a lot of other issues that really mean that the young people are losing trust in the political life and the institutions of justice and 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 democracy and I think we we can see that really on the rise in many countries so we also think education equality education education that is relevant as a key role to play in empowering students to understand their fundamental rights and really to become themselves cha champion for justice in society so we have actually developed um, uh, material and handbooks and this is something we can also share one for primary education and one from primary school and one for secondary uh, schools to help teachers empower the the students and these are really lessons that is that are very handy uh, in, in these handbooks they are available in a number of languages they are very interactive uh, so students can really participate in for example mock election or take on the role of judges of local majors or even of displaced people Right, and we use a lot of games and storytelling to really help bringing social issues to to um, to life, and also to 
you know, help students to prompt students to take a moral stand. And, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, you know, teachers are very much engaged in that. So I think, uh, um, you know, these are materials and this is an initiative they really try to expand uh, because uh, I think also looking at uh, the, um, the current situation with the, with the pandemic that as you, you, you may also live in India, this has really brought in an additional level of uh, mistrust, I would say, in many, to, to, you know, vis-a-vis -vis many institutions and, uh, and, uh, and public institutions. And I think it's, it's, it's actually a big challenge that we face. Um, that now, you know, my, my last part actually, and, uh, and I would like to close on some few reflections, is, uh, um, is about these three domains of global citizenship education that I was mentioning. Um, UNESCO has recently commissioned a study on the extent to which the cognitive, the behavioral and the social emotional dimension of learning are, are reflected in curricula. Uh, of uh, 10 countries and these were countries 10 countries from um, the different regions uh, in Asia and Pacific we were with uh, um, uh, Japan and with uh, Korea then we had Rwanda Sweden Mexico Morocco Costa Rica etc and uh, and uh, this is a study that rested really on the premise that all these three dimension of learning must be utilized in order to make global citizenship and education for sustainable development truly transformative. And, um, and the, what uh, we found with, the, with, the, with this analysis actually is that um, while these topics, global citizenship, even if it's called differently, and education for sustainable development are generally reflected in education policies and curriculum, across many countries. The full range of knowledge, of values, of skills, of attitudes, of behaviors that are needed to really become, effectively become uh, responsible um, agents of a more peaceful and sustainable world are most likely uh, not being taught and developed in, uh, in informal uh, education. Um, because uh, while you know all these countries really call for the implementation of uh, global citizenship education but uh, the educational programs are not really fully compliant with the pedagogical principle of uh, dcd for example the social and emotional and the behavioral dimensions of learning unfortunately are insufficiently developed uh, beyond the early years right uh, so in the early years this is where you find it while you move up on the ladder of education it becomes very week. Um, but these are uh, in, you know, important to ensure that education develops the full range of these values and knowledge and attitude needed for responsible engagement. Um, for example, this, this study also showed us that some subjects offer more diverse learning experiences than others do. Um, for example, the social sciences and the natural sciences subject tend to be more focused on the cognitive aspect of learning, one could expect that, compared to the language uh, program that really covered a much broader range of learning uh, experiences. Uh, so, pre-primary and primary levels normally are where you have more, you find more holistic learning experiences compared to secondary levels that really have a greater focus on the cognitive compared to the social and emotional dimension of learning. And by pointing that is um, really to draw the attention on this particular dimension because I think uh, um, going to the current um, context and reality that we are living, you know, through COVID, I think you have all seen what the impact of this crisis is having. You know, when it comes to the education system, you've seen that 90% of a, a student population around the world was out of school. Um, and it has been the first time that this phenomenon happened uh, to such a massive uh, um, level. And, um, and uh, so we really find, we are finding ourselves in a very unprecedented situation. And at the same time, it's a situation that, as sad as it is, it also offers us opportunity to really reflect you know, on the role of education in shaping our future uh, society. So we are like in a, in a sort of a balance where we look at global versus local, the discrimination Hello? versus inclusion. Hello? Hello? Please continue. There was a slight disturbance. Okay, no, it's fine. I'm I'm almost done actually. 
So, um, so and and while our focus and uh, and and I believe India is living the same uh, moment is right now is very much on the immediate educational needs of the country and on the urgent response to ensure continuity of learning. And we have seen the massive response of country when it comes to that. Um, I think it's really the, the, the transformative skills that global citizenship imparts that will be needed for a long-term recovery and the building of more resilient education system because I believe this is actually the key point, you know, to, to, to build this resilience. So. Um, so while we, we have seen a big devastation of this pandemic on the life of many people, and this will continue, and the livelihood of society across the world, at the same time, we have also seen how this has uh, revived some bond of solidarity among uh, even countries and nations of the world across people. Um, and um, we have also seen the stand that people are taking you know, against injustice, inequality around the world. So. Um, why we we face this challenge of also of increased anxiety uh, fear we know we all live this sense of insecurity i think uh, the social emotional dimension of learning becomes really very key and this uh, this uh, um, notion of social emotional learning that uh, um, uh, develop you know skills such as self awareness self regulation interpersonal communication compassion uh, cognitive empathy this sense of solidarity uh, with with the common humanity is really extremely important and uh, we really consider the social emotional learning to be a key component of quality education and uh, and uh, skills social emotional skills to really be core in maintaining emotional well-being and caring for uh, others so i you know one thing that we strongly really promote is that um, social emotional skills should be holistically integrated in education system uh, really with schools becoming spaces for dialogue between knowledge and uh, and uh, culture and um and i think um the um the what we have seen uh, and correct me if i'm wrong but i was reading recently of uh, uh, india that has adopted this new education policy and i think that uh, it has a, a big focus actually on the holistic development of the child so the attention on the social emotional dimension is key and uh, you know, if that's really the case, you know, based on what I was reading, I think, you know, the country really should be congratulated for uh, for that. Um, so I think um, just to conclude, and then we, we can have, you know, a set of questions and uh, uh, if you have any comments or questions. Um, I think there are two, uh, there, there is actually one point that uh, uh, I also would like to underline and I think it's important and because it's a point that we, it's part of our current reflection when it comes to global citizenship education. Um, and this work in progress, I would say. So it's always good to have reflection on that. While global citizenship education, we can see it's moving into the mainstream of the education uh, discourse. And uh, I think still the, the, there are unresolved tension and also some misunderstanding with regard to the concept uh, that actually can also explain why its uptake is, is very variable, right, between countries and region. And is a concept that actually needs also to be contextualized, if you want. Um, and I think we need to address that uh, in order to ensure that through global citizenship, we can address this challenge. And in particular, I think we, we can see two, two, uh, two trends, if you want. Um, now, first is the importance to keep the respect for human rights and the learning to live together in peace and dignity at the core of our work on global citizenship. We have seen through all the experiences that uh, countries have that uh, you can implement global citizenship education in a variety of ways across the system to different degrees, from a very minimalist approach to a more deeper approach. Uh, you can translate GCD into the promotion of just specific skill for peaceful coexistence, for example, when it comes to intercultural competencies or conflict management. Or in, you have cases where you can really materialize as human rights education or a more overarching educational commitment to active citizenship, to social transformation and global solidarity. And uh, so these are all actions 
all, all these actions are modalities of implementation of GCD that can be situated along a sort of continuum of valid learning uh, outcome. However, we should really not lose sight of the notion that, uh, that at the core of all these approaches, we should have a really strong commitment to human rights and the will to learn to live together in peace and dignity. I think it's important. And the second and last point is uh, the how we are uh, decentering this vision of global uh, citizenship and learning about global citizenship and for global citizenship um, should actually evolve from the analysis of uh, one own worldview and legacy really and help to understand the power dynamics that shape our places in uh, in, uh, in in the world um, and this implies of course not only that we are exposed the learners are ex exposed to different perspectives on the world and uh, learning contexts that can be produced by other communities and uh, other groups but more importantly that um, we empower individuals to envisage different scenario for the future right and to take responsibility for one's decision and uh, an action so um i think uh, um i would like to actually close here uh, and as i said uh, i think uh, uh, india has uh, in the in this period with this your new nep your new nap uh, and this emphasis that i've seen it plays on the development of the creative potential right of each individual in all his richness uh, um, I think uh, uh, it's really based on this principle that education is must develop not only the cognitive uh, skills um, and higher order cognitive skills, but also the social emotional dimension, uh, right? Cultural awareness and empathy. And I think this is a very interesting uh, part and this really closely resonate with our vision of global uh, citizenship education and the importance of the social emotional dimension to achieve uh, our education agenda. So I think I can close it here. Probably I even went beyond my time. And thank you Absolutely. very much for listening. Uh, yeah, yeah, Cecilia. So thank you so much. I think, uh, you know, uh, the whole uh, team was actually clued and listening to whatever you were saying, which was very right when we really need to focus on the four pillars of learning. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, I'm sure everybody has lots to say and ask and share, you know, but uh, just coming back to the new education policy that you mentioned, yes, we have it in place. Uh, see, uh, you know, as far as cognitive and other skills are concerned and other, other areas of development is concerned, you know, we have always been focused on, you know, focus, you know, get, getting into holistic approach. Mm -hmm. and Definitely we follow integrated learning, but somewhere, you know, social emotional aspect is one area, you know, which gets, uh, you know, under the blanket, you know, because thinking that cognitive is something which is of, you know, importance, but <laughs> you know, with the changing uh, scenario around the world, I think, you know, people have realized that you know, social emotional yeah. aspect is something that we really need to focus right from the beginning, which is, uh, you know, one of the very core values of our, you know, Indian system of uh, upbringing, uh, you know, a child mm -hmm. is concerned, you know, so I would say that uh, maybe it's not difficult for us to get back to the core value, but it's just that we will need to do a retuning as far as, you know, again, giving that kind of importance to social emotional development. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just, uh, uh, you know, want you to just... Uh, you know, uh, help us understand, you know, when we talk about four pillars of learning, when you're talking about different parameters like cognitive, social, emotional, and, you know, logic, uh, as for your understanding, you know, what should be the weightage that should be given to, you know, uh, different aspects of learning? Weight, you said? Uh, I said, as for you, what should be the different, uh, what should be the weightage given to the different aspects of learning? You know, what do you think as per the priority list should be on the top? About the three domains, well, yeah. uh, the pillars is the same because, you know, somehow, you know, they are developed based on these four pillars. Uh, I, I think they are all, you know, they are equally important. But honestly, if you really look at, uh, well, they're equally important because I think, as we were saying, you know, they are balanced, right? They need to be balanced, you know, to really ensure a very harmonious development, actually, of the individual. 
but uh, I think we have we went through decades of neglect, I would say, of the uh, the more social emotional component, as you as you also pointed out, because I believe also of uh, of uh, I mean of uh, of decades of um, promotion of economic system and of a vision of education that was tailored for that economic system, that was more utilitaristic, and I mean, and this is. This is clear, I think, and evident. You know, these are also political, historical moments, and um, and I think now we have uh, we had um, we have a more clear understanding of the impact of that, and that's why since years there has been this attempt really to rethink the the purpose of education. Because I believe the point is really education for what, you know, what it, we, we have education for what and for whom, what what type of citizen we we envision right uh, uh, that we want in our countries. And uh, but it's still difficult because I can see even that it, there is this shift with the recognition actually that. Some of these dimensions look at this issue of the capacity to, li to, to really to live together in peace, you know, in a sustainable and peaceful environment. Uh, this has been entirely neglected in the past. Uh, and, and again, because we are in system that, you know, education is not in a vacuum. Right. So even if you want to transform education and you think of the purpose uh, is a big reflection. But if you don't also change what is around that vision of education, right, uh, it's very difficult because you have a lot of tensions there. And I believe that, you know, I mean, it's interesting when I was uh, in my last few years, I was working in Latin America, the Caribbean. And I was raised in Chile, and it was a very strong conversation that you could have in the education community of Chile, which is a country with a, you know, very neoliberal economy, sincere, you know, uh, well country, wealthy country. And uh, we're attempting to really big, uh, do a big reform in education that was highly unequal, is an unequal education system, but it's very difficult. You know, to go in a direction if you don't have this reflection at the national level, because it's really the future that the country wants for itself, that also define and design the what of your education. So for me, this component of social emotional and the behavioral one is also very key. Because what we say is uh, we need also to, uh, to transform. What we learn is also is to have to develop as individual, but also to allow us to be empowered, you know, to act. And, uh, you know, when we talk about um, adapting, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Adapting to climate change, adapting yeah. to you know the a very uh, rapidly shifting economic system or uh, or production you know models. I think you know the word adaptation. Sometimes we should, I don't know, probably we shouldn't use it so often because you can adapt, but you can also change. And yes. I think our focus should be on the changing part, not just adapting to something that. You know, we cannot do anything about it, even if we don't like it, you know, or it has a bad impact on us. It's difficult, but that's why we're saying this component of behavior and of, uh, of uh, um, power to act, which I think is what you're doing, by the way, with your program. If I could see the work you're doing with girls and, you know, I, yes. I think it's very key because uh, if without action, it's difficult that you change, you know, yes. for yourself and for your, you know, surrounding. So I, I, I would really put these, these two dimensions is to regain a much bigger weight than, mm. uh, you know, they had in the past. Yeah. I agree. No, I absolutely agree, you know, with all these, uh, you know, domains and factors. I think something very, very important is, you know, living together in peace and harmony. I think that is something tolerance towards each other and, you know, capacity to change and, you know, accepting the change is also very important, not only adapting. Uh, you know, with this, uh, Cecily, I would request, uh, you know, anybody who would like to kuch bolna chahenge, puchna chahenge, please boli hai, you know, we can help in translation and everything. Mm -hmm. I know the team can definitely, you know, uh, you know, speak in English also, but anywhere, if you need help, we are here. So, uh, koi kuch bolna chahega? Uh, Preeti? Yes, Rukmini. Over uh, to Rukmini, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Cecilia, ma'am. And thank you so much for uh, the lovely, uh, the, all the information that you shared. It's really, really important, uh, especially now when, you know, uh, we see 
Rukmini, it would be nice is... if you can switch on your camera. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have a very bad network. I'm just switching it on. Okay, then let uh, it be. My, Not a problem. My, yeah. yeah. So I have a very, very bad network. It's not clear. Um, so, uh, you know, being, we, we are all global citizens and uh, currently we don't belong to any state or, um, you know, any village anymore. And uh, we need to be uh, more aware of our surroundings. And, you know, so um, global citizenship has become very, an, a very important skill. We need to imbibe uh, in our students. And for that, what has uh, become important is the teachers as you rightly mentioned that you know teachers and the way of teaching it's not a, it's not education a particular subject that you teach students at a higher class it's it's a skill that you need to develop like you need to develop critical thinking or communication collaboration or be it digital skills or any or leadership for that matter but um, uh, global citizenship is also another skill which needs to be developed in a child from the very beginning. Hence, um, the, the way of teaching and the teaching methodology to, um, to, you know, because our curriculum is a fixed curriculum, but the world outside is a dynamic, dynamic one. Things are changing every day. So uh, to, uh, to kind of... Uh, make the students equipped to adapt to the changing uh, um, environment. Uh, we need to inculcate global citizenship skills from the very beginning. Now, uh, coming to the way we, we run our centers and our teachers, do you think um, that it will be helpful for the teachers to come up with like a framework or an action plan as to how they are connecting um, the, each of the subjects that they are teaching to a sustainable goal or to, uh, to kind of uh, develop the, the three outcomes that you spoke about, uh, knowledge, skills and um, attitude or you know and how you know they're teaching it in a way that the, the, the regular subject that they would teach in a way that it would connect with uh, uh, some of the sustainable goals and it would it would teach them a, 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 an attribute of global citizenship so that's what i want yes no uh, yes can you hear me Yes, I can. Yes. No, uh, Rukmini, thank you very much. Absolutely so. I mean, uh, I think uh, I can just uh, agree with you. <laughs> I would say. We have actually done this the, the, an exercise a few years back, and that was, at, I would say, one of the first publications really that UNESCO did, a very practical one, which is called Topic and Learning Objectives. And this is something I can share with you. And, uh, and uh, I mean, and if you're interested uh, with, as an organization, perhaps we could try and do more work together on that. And this is really aimed at uh, uh, giving teachers, right, uh, the, the knowledge and the skills to, um, to integrate this dimension. I mean, in, to integrate GCD into their uh, learning, uh, learning objectives, into their teaching and learning objectives, in designing their plans. And this is for the different levels of education. So, the, so you can see, you know, of course, the, let's say the, the topic that you want to address, the type of skills and competence that you want to develop, and there are examples on how to do that. And this is doing exactly what you were mentioning, you know, to try really and connect your, this, your teaching of your discipline uh, also to the experience and to the to the world actually of the learners right um, and uh, and and also link it to as we were saying the local reality and how this is also linked to a more global perspective so this is this is a tool actually because it's really a tool that I think can be helpful also to really visualize right what does it mean and it gives a lot of examples is certainly uh, shared and there are a lot of experiences in that regard. In many countries, um, I've seen there are uh, very interesting uh, and, and exciting experience also now to um, to link the you know the teaching uh, with with the global development agenda, with the sustainable development goals, for example. A lot of tools and nice also ways you know that one can use. Uh, um, 
with, with, with the learners to, you know, to make them understand. And I think, you know, at the end, this is, you know, it's a matter really of pedagogy, you know, and, uh, and uh, to really ensure that uh, also the learning of the children, of, of, the, of, of the young people, actually, not only the children, uh, it really relates with their with their life with their real reality and how they can see that relating to the broader context um, and how they can act on that I think you know that that's also the point right so there are a number of tools that we I, I could even share actually quite a, quite a few with you if you are interested and mm -hmm. uh, and this certainly can be done and even perhaps you know put you in touch with other organizations who are doing something similar I think it mm -hmm. could be was an interesting exchange Thank you so much. Yeah, I think this would be really nice, you know, where we can actually get. Yes, yes Ravi, you want to say something? No, actually, she covered the last part. She covered it in the last part uh, that I wanted ki, uh, some of the technological things that uh, she or anyone can share. That will be great because uh, uh, working in such, a, such an area we have constraints like network and other things so if mm -hmm. there is something if there is something that we can work on uh, so that we can take these technologies technological part and other things to these people to these teachers and students that will be that will be really helpful for them also and to us also in fact oh. so in case if this can be done sure Okay, no, that, that would be fine. Uh, perhaps, you know, what we could also do, I mean, I can share, of course, uh, the, the material, the kits, the tools uh, that, um, uh, that we have, not just us as UNESCO, but also through our, uh, you know, colleagues in the field, uh, which I think is even more relevant. Uh, perhaps uh, what we could do, since you, you know, you really work in specific contexts, and I know, I, I can see with uh, um, with the colleagues, with the Shub and Shubang as well. You know, if you also tell me, you know, the type of needs that you have in your communities, so that I can also find perhaps other experiences that could sort of relate to that, right? Other, let's say, solutions found somewhere else that perhaps could be also useful for your context. Yeah. Yeah. I think but that's at this time we are uh, we are mostly dependent on these uh, technological efforts only uh, on I know. net, on uh, <laughs> Zoom and everything. So yeah. definitely we need, I know. Uh, something better to reach. Yeah. Actually, the uh, you know just to 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 tell you what has happened in, in you know during this crisis, uh, you know just to show you know when when let's say when there is the will there is the way at the end because uh, uh, with this you know with the school this massive school closure actually uh, in, in UNESCO we we had launched what we call this global education coalition. I don't know if you heard about that, um, but you you can actually you know look at our page the one of you can and it will be there. And, you know, really because there were, you know, it was really a matter of you know, sort of calling, right, the community to really find a way to help uh, countries to ensure this continuity of learning. And, you know, at the first, uh, in, 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 at the beginning, and still it is actually, is a matter of finding the means to be able to connect the teachers with the learners, right? And, and this is actually what implied connectivity. Other means is not just, you know, through computer and Zoom, you know, countries, in, in number of countries, they are using a lot radio, for example. Again, which is a tool which I always find extremely powerful. And also TV. TV less, but many countries all over the world are starting to use TV even for training as well, which you know we have not been doing for many for many many years anymore. And uh, so it is a coalition where many came in, and many of the big companies, um, tech companies, also join. And the idea is then to really look at needs in the different countries and see how you know through their uh, what they can offer, and they can offer a lot. You know, we also know that uh, this crisis somehow has uh, brought a big increase actually in the in the income of the tech companies, as we all know. Uh, so what, what, what they can really offer. And in a number of countries, for example, there were this agreement that uh, the connectivity was really done at uh, no cost. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of interesting experience happened. But that's why, because of course there was also, you know, the pressure 
And, uh, and I think it's also really the time for, uh, you know, all these uh, big companies that work in the technology and in the communication to really sort of, uh, you know, give back uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and ensure this. And this is working in a number of countries in Africa. Uh, we have seen that there, is, there, are, there have been agreement really to provide free connectivity and, uh, and equipment to, um, you know, to, 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 to learn us. This is actually, this is a big issue. And I think this is not going away as, as, as you know, but I think it has, uh, you know, one thing that it has shown Ravi is that, you know, in all countries, of course, at a different level, there has been, there is a big gap when it comes to, um, you know, the, the, the preparedness actually, and the, and the, and the connectivity, you know, for learners. Um, and of course, this shows again the inequality that we have. It is, I think the crisis has somehow magnified that. But in every country, there is a big gap. So the, the, the big risk now is really to make sure that who has already been left behind before, you know, it can be sort of recovered because um, probably we will continue to see also a lot of online learning. Um, so we need to sort of prepare for that. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Yeah, anybody else would like to say because we can, I think uh, so just a few minutes so, and you know one or two more. Yeah. Ravi? Just one 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 single question. <laughs> one single question. Uh, uh, let's say let's say let's say if you avoid these technological parts and and uh, you being in you have been to so many countries, so do we have do we have any such uh, thing that uh, we can reach to so that we can uh, take these things to teachers and uh, students here yeah. because we have too much constraints regarding these uh, technological things or uh, zoom and this and that so mm. we have so many constraints so you might be having some uh, you might have encountered some of the things in several countries that that can uh, be reached without network and without things without without uh, this net and everything. Yes, I, I'm not sure I understand uh, Ravi very well the, the, the question. Um, if I if I know you know be, um, if you have a way to sort of reach this connection or, or ensure that the teacher reach the the students without going through the connectivity, the, the digital connectivity, is that the question? It was like, do we have any other model to reach to these students and uh, teachers, those who do not have any connectivity there? So okay. do we have any other model to yes. reach? Yes. Well, them? as I was saying, uh, you know, we there are countries that are using a lot the radio, for example. The, as, uh, radio you know, is, as you said, as you sorry, sorry, sorry to disturb you. Uh, as you said, they they, they are. You know, huge companies involved in that and uh, broadcasting things and telecommunication all apart. So instead of that, is there anything that we can uh, think of? Instead of, for example, tools like the radio? Anji, except, except, except radio. Yeah. Oof, that's not easy, huh? because uh, I mean, again, I mean, you need to have a certain, a certain, uh, at least you need to have some means to, to, to transfer the information. So if you go beyond radio and uh, I mean, you, what you could do is also to, to resort again to sort of recording things, uh, right? But, uh, you know, I really need to see the type of contest that, that, that you talk about. I mean, uh, um, um, in the past, we also used uh, in many cases. You know, when you when you looked at how the distance education functioned, um, you had uh, a way to record things and to send things to people, and the people. But again, they need to be able to listen something or to watch something. So find means to record a lot of things. Um, and, 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 and provide it to the, to the learners. I think now probably, again, the new technologies, this type of means could still be improved. Probably they are less, they are less and less, again, because of the connectivity that is taking over, actually. The, the telephone, you can exactly. do a lot with the telephone, for example. And, but I believe, of course, you have communication. You may still have communication costs because uh, if people need to sort of uh, spend time with the telephone, this can have a, a cost, of course. But through the telephone, I believe the, the latest experiences that uh, we, we could see, even in South Asia, 
uh, have been very successful uh, with telephones, for example. Um, where now you can really do a lot. Now, again, it implies the telephone, at least for a small community, if not, if not an individual, but at least for a community. And uh, so you have some sort of uh, connect connectivity uh, design, if you want. Um, one can see, you know, one, I can have a look if there are really some sort of very, very low, uh, how can I say, connectivity needs to, to transfer uh, knowledge and information. Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, anybody else? Kisi ko kuch puchna ho, ko share karna ho. Yes. I do really request her to share some of the things that she she had an experience of. So that will be really that will be really great. Ravi, can you please be a little louder? I request her to share some of her experiences and the things that she has worked upon. So, might be might be that can help us to take this to our students and teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, uh, um, one second, even Mamta wants to say something. So, we will just, well, yeah, Mamta, yeah. please. So thank you, Cecilia, ma'am, for like you know giving us insights from across the world about global citizenship. And I wanted to know specifically, or rather, would like to like you to comment on the role of gender in building this global citizenship, because specifically we are working with girl child education of the United states. It's it's important for us to know how your experiences uh, around working in with genders. Cecilia, could you get the question? You're on mute. No, no. Sorry. Okay. No, it was cutting here and there. I'm not sure I got it there. If you can repeat it, it would, I would appreciate it. Yeah, Mamta, please repeat yeah. it. Uh, you know, after this, we will take Kiranjit's uh, thing also. Please, Mamta. I uh, would like you to comment on, ma'am, gender and its role in building global, global citizenship. Okay, thanks. Well, you know, to us, gen gender equality is, is a principle, uh, by the way, of this global uh, agenda, it is a dimension of global citizenship. And it, it actually, gender equality is a key dimension of this, uh, what I say, this special target uh, that really is at the heart of the agenda of building competencies and skills for that aimed at acquiring, you know, this uh, understanding, this. Uh, capacity to be um, to be empathic with the others and really become transformative in our own community that's that's a key dimension of that now what i can say is that uh, it's still a challenge uh, and i would say in, in in most of the countries because it it's really present itself as a challenge uh, at different level but uh, you know when we talk again about um, an education of quality uh, this is an education that has to be gender, um, that has to promote gender equality. Um, and, uh, and, and I think this is a lens uh, that we need to apply in everything we do from the PNIF system, from the planning to the implementation to the assessment. Uh, in everything through the training, um, there are a lot of tools. I think it's, uh, it requires a lot of uh, um, a lot of training for the teachers as well and when, you know when I talk about gender equality it really means you know you work with girls uh, but it really means working with you know uh, all the groups because also working with boys on these issues and men it's, it's, it's equally important because uh, you know you cannot educate just one part and not the others when it comes to aspect of uh, you know, mutual respect. The principle the global citizenship promote are actually Im embed, you know, the dimension of, uh, of, uh, of gender equality. When we talk about human rights, you know, that's there. You, you cannot sort of uh, get away with that. So um, I say, yeah, it, 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 it's key. Um, I think sometimes, you know, what we tend to do is sort of um, look at, at the work on gender equality, mainstreaming gender, gender equality in, in all our actions, if you want, as a sort of separate thing, but it's not. Because when, when we really talk about the, a transformative education, uh, this is one, uh, one key areas that is, is, is part of that. You know, society is composed of, uh, of uh, different genders, I would say. 
and, uh, and, and I believe uh, what we uh, want to achieve with global citizenship and, and, and these key um, learning domains is also to, you know, as I say, uh, learn to appreciate and respect uh, all the others, right? Whoever they are. Um, and, and appreciate what they can contribute. So I think there is still a long way to go. Uh, we have seen now with the, also with this crisis, the impact is probably on girls would be much higher than on boys when it comes to going back to school because of, again, issues that are linked, you know, to livelihoods that are linked to culture and traditions, you know, where normally uh, girls are more behind or are kept behind if you want. Being, uh, and um, so we need probably to even double the efforts, but uh, but uh, I, I think it's absolutely absolutely key. You know, when we talk about uh, equality and and equity, you know, gender is there absolutely. Oh, ma'am, thank you. Yeah, that's so true. Anybody? Uh, yeah, Kiranji wanted to ask something. Cecilia, you have time, right? Yeah. Okay. Please let us know because we will go on and on. <laughs> it's fine. I have another 15, 20 minutes is fine. Okay. Okay, Cecilia. Kiran, you wanted to say something? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ah. Hello, Cecilia, ma'am. Hi. So, uh, so ma'am, my question is on new uh, education policy, which is being proposed in India now. So, um, my uh, question is like, we were going through that uh, our old education policy and we also uh, like studied in the same policy in the school now the policy has been changed so i my question is what is your opinion based on old education policy in india and the new education policy like i had read some of the points like uh, now the kids will be assessed by by through peer assessment also like uh, half of the assessment will be done by the students or their classmates and half will be done by the teacher so what is your opinion on that <laughs> for me this is a very difficult question because i didn't you know i don't know i, I don't know very well yet the new policy actually so i i'm not sure i can give you a proper answer uh, you know comparing the two because these are actually details of of that i didn't get the last few sentences when you say this change in in, in assessment so but i really i think i'm afraid i i don't have all the elements to compare the two not yet what i read about the new policy you no know, i read some general um, you know comments and uh, some general things on uh, you know on the on this focus actually that the new policies has and uh, and which which i find very positive but i don't i don't know the details of that especially when it comes to the issue of assessment so i will have to inform myself which i can do uh, in our long conversation with Hubangi, hopefully and i can get back to you on that if you don't mind uh -huh. Uh -huh. okay sure sure yeah, actually true because uh, uh, Kiran, I think we can definitely have a session and we can discuss on the new policy also soon. Uh, mm -hmm. Anybody else? Sadiq wanted to ask something, but I think there is some connection error. That's the reason he's mm -hmm. not. Priti, Priti. Yeah, yes, can yes, I please, ask, Shubangi. Priti, can I ask one question from Cecilia? Please. Okay. So, Cecilia. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask you one question. Cecilia, you have been in India for two years, right? And, uh, and you have uh, also seen uh, Indian education system and uh, to a limited extent, you are also sort of aware of the socio-cultural predicament of girls in India. So my mm -hmm. question is going to be very, very simple uh, for you, uh, but we but wanted to understand your perspective. As as you know that you can actually focus on primary education of girls. So yeah, so our focus is primary education and of girls and that also who live in rural areas and who come from socio-culturally deprived backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. Basis your global experience with various educational systems in various countries what do you see what what are the five challenges which you would want to list down when it comes to education of girls who come from deprived backgrounds which a teacher should be mindful of is what my question is to you 
Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Shubangi. Yeah, well, challenge, challenges are many, and, and I, I think India is a, is a continent per se, right? <laughs> Very diverse. So I think it sort of includes it integrates ch many challenges that you have in many other countries. I think, you know, when it comes to, um, to uh, the challenges that the teacher has to, uh, you know, take into account, f for sure, I think you, you need to be able to... Um, understand uh, the well the context and be able I would say to understand and know each and every child that comes to you which is feasible even it will be classes I would say um, because uh, you know a child you know brings with him or her uh, you know a word right and uh, and I think uh, you know when you look at the situation, you say you, you work with girls uh, and uh, coming from probably very rural um, and uh, and uh, and vulnerable uh, communities. So you will have issues, uh, I believe, of uh, empowerment or lack lack of empowerment of, of, of the girls. You have issues of uh, of the uh, of the task and the challenges that the girls live every day. Uh, issue of language, of course, it's it's, it's very important. Um, uh, you have the 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 socioeconomic context, of course. So somehow a teacher has to be, I think, extremely, um, I would say, fair and empathic, and uh, and uh, and uh, and and have, uh, I would say, expectations that are. Uh, that are not somehow ampering, you know, the, the girls. You know, we always have our own biases, right? So I believe when you need to understand the, what does it mean, the diversity that you have in front of you, uh, and, and the need to have absolute inclusion in, in your class, which are skills that you learn, actually, uh, because, uh, you know, it, I think it requires also a lot of knowledge and experience and, uh, and passion and understanding, actually, to, be, uh, to teach uh, groups that can be so diverse and that come from different type of vulnerabilities, right? Because when you talk about girls, you have an intersection, I would say, of vulnerability, right? Um, so, so definitely you will have this challenge. I think is the big challenge probably is also the relations with the families. Uh, I've seen this happening in many countries. Um, you know, there is a lot of, um, a lot of uh, complaints from the schools sometimes and the school management and even the teachers on the, you know, on, on this lack of relation or lack of interest, I would say, rather. Uh, of families and parents uh, for the uh, schooling of the children. Uh, but I, I think in this case, it would be very important for the teachers to really be able to you know, make this connection. We know, you know, that the, I think the environment uh, and the, the extra support that the learner receive is very important for everyone. And we have seen, I recall, in India in the past, Shubang, you may remember, you know, with the other study, we had a lot of discussion. I mean, this was very important. The, the extra support that you can have in your learning, especially if you have already some, you know, sort of gaps um, uh, that you make, uh, you need to make up for. It's, a, it's even almost more important than anything that can happen in the class somehow. So I think in certain contexts it's very difficult to have this support provided through families or through the communities or the environment of the child. So I think a really teachers should be very much aware and perhaps uh, you know, also ensure that there is some sort of uh, work to create, to establish this support that I believe, this support system that I believe your program is actually uh, doing. And I think as a teacher, of course, you need to, uh, I don't know if you just work only with girls, uh, in, in, in the school. I've seen all your program on girls, but uh, um, I will say these are the key, I mean, these are the huge challenges that the teacher has to face. And you are in a community where I believe also in terms of uh, the, the equipment, the, you know, the resources that you have, uh, you can have limits probably, right? Um, so teachers have to be extremely, I think, creative and passionate, and uh, and, uh, and 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 really, I believe, make sure that they have the the capacity to uh, you know to really be able to empower the girls because you know this really goes beyond just the you know the acquisition of their knowledge in terms of subject. I can see you know the issue there is really the the, the acquisition of uh, you know the empowerment to really. 
uh, you know, understand who you are, what you want to do, and make them aware of the possibilities, right, that they have. And uh, so these are, I, I find them actually very huge challenges. And, and, and again, I think, you know, you know, very frankly, you know, India is also a context where socially you have sometimes limitations, right? Um, and, and I believe since you work with girls, really, who comes from vulnerable, very vulnerable groups, um, I think this exercise of uh, a sort of uh, having them, right, uh, valuing themselves and knowing that they can achieve, you know, you know what, what, what they would like to, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. Probably it also goes, uh, you have issues when it comes also to understanding and the cultural exchanges also with the families on that and the expectation the families have on girls, right, that, that, that you can have as a teachers are very different. So probably these are even more than five. Now, in terms of how you train these teachers, uh, I don't know if you work with teachers that you train or you have teachers joining the program, and these are uh, the, the school teachers, but uh, I believe in general, you know, the, 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 the training that uh, teachers receive, of course, is still not adequate to really work in, uh, in, uh, with such a level of diversity, I would say, uh, in, uh, in, in the classroom and making sure that you really know how to respond to uh, each and everyone's uh, needs which are very different, you know, when, you know, when we talk about uh, uh, being an inclusive, uh, you know, every teacher has a, an inclusive, should have an inclusive classroom because we all have a lot of diversity in every classroom, wherever you are, uh, even if it's not, even if you're not in a very rural areas, all our classroom, even here in Europe, you meet a lot of diversity, children who come from different background, different origin, who have problems, personal issues, family issues, right? So I think this, this, I think this is really probably the most important characteristic the teacher should have to really try to sort of meet that, uh, you know, that need of a child. Um, or of, of, of a young person. So I believe that's the most important thing. And you see the, especially in context where you don't, you have big groups uh, that you have to teach, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the personal knowledge and understanding of a learner, I think it's very key, is what we miss a lot. You know, if you consider, uh, but this is, I think it, it is what can change really, you know, even the learning. Um, uh, outcomes, if you want, of of of, of a child. The I, I think one of the things with this crisis that I was uh, reading, and it was interesting, listening also to to friends who are teachers, right, is that uh, on one hand you can see, especially the ones who have to connect via Zoom, where all the you know digital devices, uh, somehow one positive thing that many could see in this in their context eh, is the possibility to uh, have more relations with each of their students because you see them also in different contexts you know they are home and uh, and uh, and they could actually really spend almost more time with each individual instead of the whole class and they and, and it's interesting you know to listen to to these teachers because they say you know it was also a way somehow to create a stronger bond between the teacher and the students having this more time that you know in a strange manner that you pass together so which means though that this is very much missing I believe many of the teachers if you ask many of the teachers in our classroom they don't really know very well the students and uh, and, uh, and, I, and and I think it is a challenge that we all face Yes, great. Uh, okay, so uh, just sticking to the time, uh, I think I can take last question or last comment if anybody would like to say something. Okay, I think people are good. This was really, yeah, this was really good talking to Cecilia, and we hope that this this support will be getting it further also. She'll be extending more and more support to us reaching these students and teachers and she'll be uh, sharing more of her experience across the world yeah you know perhaps one thing that we could do we could look into that is uh, uh, you know find some of the some some teachers or some of, of, of uh, you know some experiences directly from other uh, countries or other regions and bring someone who can share you know, um, experiences that are similar to what you do, for example, just in other contexts, 
we could identify someone who could, uh, you know, spend some time and, and like give a, have an exchange with you like we had today, if you're interested. Yes, absolutely. That would help. I, Definitely. I absolutely agree with what you're saying, Cecilia. We need, you know, your insights also, your experience. And if you can connect us, it will be really great. Mm -hmm. We'll do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Sandeep sir is also here with us. He's the CEO of uh, that. You know, I would like him to share his views uh, and also thank Cecilia for, you know, giving us so much of time and insight. Sandeep sir? Yeah, I think he will just, uh, you know, join it. He's very much around. In the meanwhile, uh, can I request everybody uh, you know, to just switch on your camera and, you know, let us all say thank you once before Sandeep sir uh, formally closes the session. So Cecilia, whole team impact would like to thank you. Like we all, yeah. Yes, everyone. Now you can unmute yourself, please. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. 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 Thanks to you and keep up, keep up the good work. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I think uh, Sandeep sir is also here. Hello. Hi. Hello, Cecilia. Hi. Hi. Uh, I can't see you right now, but uh, uh, but just uh, half of uh, all of us in impact and uh, all, 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 all and the entire team members and the fraternity, a big, big thank you to you for uh, you know, sharing this, all this information with us. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and Shubham is surprising, getting better and better. But uh, truly, truly, a big, big thank you to you. And, and uh, it was indeed very insightful. And to get a, a perspective which is uh, so different and it, it indeed a big, big learning for us. So thank you once again from all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. Great. Hello. I, yes, sir. And no, I just wanted to ask Cecilia that how's the how's the COVID situation in uh, back over there? In France, okay. uh, well, it's getting worse now. You know, you can see the numbers. We we it's on the increase again, Europe. And in France, um, let's see, I, I believe, you know, in our case, we have been uh, ending the lockdown uh, already, you know, back in, let's say, May, partially. Um, I think there is, uh, France, I can see people are relaxing, you know, we are in summer. And, uh, and I think what we have seen now is, uh, is a, an increase, actually a, a substantial increase in the past few weeks. And it's seen particularly in the age group of, you know, the younger people, 20, 35. Um, because, uh, well, I believe, you know, younger people are, are, are out. I mean, uh, you know, it has been, I think, a very painful experience for everyone, but for the youngest, probably even more. And, um, you know, the, pre the pre precautions are sort of not entirely respected. Uh, but, you know, here we have the, we are obliged to wear the masks uh, when you are in the, with the public transport, when you are in buildings, you know, public closed buildings. Um, but out in the street, uh, you know, you don't see too many people with, with the mask. Um, so we'll see. I mean, it's really, I, I believe, you know, nobody really knows how the situation will evolve. Uh, we'll see in the next months what will happen. I don't think we will go into a new lockdown, but um, also because, you know, the economic impact is, is very, very heavy. And I'm sure you also leave this in India. Um, so we'll see. But uh, yeah, we, we can see the changes now again. Sorry. So this is what I can say. 
we 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 all hope that uh, th there is going to be soon some sort of uh, discovery <laughs> yes that's true we are all praying for that yeah uh, great to have mm -hmm. and uh, make the madam yeah so thank you uh, thank you for the thank you from all of us thanks a lot okay bye bye Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Team Impact. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.